Labdien, sveiki, hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm quite confused, I don't know where to look at, the camera maybe? Hello, everybody online watching us now. Hello, my dear friends and colleagues and partners here at Riga Stradinch University. And uh, hi, my friends online who will join us for the conversation. I don't see you yet, but hopefully, uh, hopefully we will, they will join us soon. Hey, hello, hello, Karina. Uh, hello, Terry. It seems that you're, you're named Elza Liepinja at the moment. Do you hear us and do you see us also? Perfect, thank you, I'm pleased. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the parallel session of the Precision Medicine Networking Forum at Riga Stradinch University. It's, it's a Thursday, it's the 13th of October. It's uh, a little more than half past three in the afternoon. My name is Juris Steinbergs and I have the great honor to be the moderator of this discussion. Uh, I really would like to thank the organizers for inviting me because this is going to be a really interesting experience for myself. As we already said a couple of days ago when we came together to build a, a skeleton or uh, at least some structure for this discussion, uh, we decided that there is no structure possible and I must admit I still don't have any plan. But uh, after everything I heard during the morning and afternoon sessions uh, at the forum, I have a couple of questions in mind which I'm going to uh, ask you. The subject, the subject of our talk today is uh, interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinary teams, and um, everything connected to competences and education in that field, if we talk, about precision medicine and more, um, uh, more in detail, uh, precision oncology. The whole forum is dedicated to precision oncology, more or less, but precision medicine, of course, works in very, very different fields, uh, also outside oncology. So I would suggest, let's do it like this. We talk at first about ourselves. So I would like to ask you to introduce to yourselves. I'll mention your names, of course, but everything else, it's up to you. You have to tell who you are, where you work, why are you there, and most interestingly to me, how did you get there, and what is the most, uh, let's say, fun part in your everyday life, and, and, and why are you doing what you are doing at the moment? Let's start with myself, okay? No, let's start by introducing the guests one by one and then, then more in detail. So, in the order I have here in the forum's program, I'll start with Baiba Vilne. Hi, Baiba. Finally, we meet in person, right? We've been talking with you on the phone and, and in Zoom meetings and so on, but I'm so glad to see you finally in person. Ladies and gentlemen, Baiba, she's, uh, she's the head of bioinformatics laboratory at Riga Stradinch University, and then details afterwards, okay? Then, Karina Silinja, hi, Karina. Say hi, so that we can hear you. Hello, hello, I hope hello. you can hear me. Hello. Karina, uh, well, yeah, she's uh, connected from uh, Zurich, correct? Switzerland. Correct. correct. Yes, you should actually explain those abbreviations yourself. You, I know you're a group leader at SNF. What's SNF? That's the Swiss, Swiss National, National Science, Science Foundation. Foundation. Okay. ETH Zürich. Now something went wrong with your mic. We don't, we still don't know what ETH is. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. All right, All right. so, so that, that stands, stands for, for Swiss, Swiss Federal, Federal Institute, Institute of Technology, Technology in German. German. Okay, Department of Chemistry and Applied Biosciences. 
Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Switzerland. Perfect, thank you. So then uh, to the left from me, uh, Martin Zoche. Uh, Martin is the director of molecular tumor profiling department of pathology and molecular pathology at the University Hospital in Zurich in Switzerland. And I'm absolutely sure this is not your only position. You probably have some more, but you will tell us about it in a moment. Okay, Martin was also performing a, a talk and a presentation in the morning uh, session at our forum. Then I'm not sure if Nils Rostox uh, from the Biomedical Research Center is going to join us, maybe later. Nils is currently the uh, director of uh, uh, Biomedical Research and Study Center uh, of Latvia. Janis Lepinch, hello. Hi. Janis Lepinch is um, a senior researcher at uh, the Faculty of Biology of University of Latvia, Institute of Microbiology and Biotechnology. And uh, you have a lot of other activities, I know, but let's talk about that later. Uh, Terry, last but not least, hi. Uh, and now hi, hi. I really, I really hope you will not be upset my, by my uh, pronunciation of your second name, uh, Terry Vrienhoek. Oh, that nice. comes close. That was close at least. So Terry is the staff and faculty advisor at the uh, Department of Genetics at the University Medical Center at Utrecht in the, Netro at the in Netherlands. And again, yes, this yes. is not the only activity by Terry. So, and now, as to me, my name is Juri Steinbergs. I'm currently the deputy head of laboratory service at Riga East University Hospital. And uh, by my background, I'm a molecular biologist. I uh, defended my a thesis at the University of Latvia, but I have spent some uh, time at Karolinska Institute in uh, Hudinge uh, in Sweden. And uh, my, my uh, second job, if I may say so, um, is a TV presenter. Of, I'm at a TV program tw every second week in the evenings for a, a, one hour and the program is called Best Taboo. It's basically short stories about everything. And I've been also uh, doing lots of science promotion. I was the moderator at the Scientific Cafe at the University of Latvia for uh, many years, so where we invited interesting people, let's say academic and applied scientists and researchers, and uh, asked them to uh, tell about their research and uh, the audience had the opportunity to ask any, any questions. 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 Yes, we have sound effects. So, and I really hope the audience here today also will have the opportunity to ask any questions you want to our, uh, our fantastic uh, members of the discussion. Okay, now to the topic. Everything about precision medicine and not only. So as I said, please tell the long story about yourself. How did you get there where you are now? What are you doing and why do you enjoy it? And what's the big benefit for society from, uh, from your everyday's work? Uh, Bible, let's start with you. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, we have to talk into the microphones because uh, this, event is uh, firstly broadcasted abroad so that Karina and Terry can hear us. Uh, that's number one. If we talk without mics, they will not hear us. And secondly, it's recorded. So uh, again, if we do not use the microphones, then it, it doesn't make any sense. Sorry, Baiba. It's your turn. Thank you very much. So the, the, ver the very long version of myself or the long version? Which one well, is the, the five-minute version, <laughs> five I would say. Five-minute version, okay. Uh, let's try to squeeze in. So yeah, I started uh, as a biologist um, here um, in Latvia, studied at the Faculty of Biology, University of Latvia. 
but already during my bachelor studies, I developed uh, an interest into bioinformatics. So basically, the topic that mostly fascinated me was the opportunity to predict protein three-dimensional structure from its sequence. It was the holy grail problem in 2006, at least. And I was lucky to find a program in Munich uh, at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, it was called Molecular Biotechnology. And it gave me the opportunity to build my course, so to say, from three different blocks, choosing bioinformatics as one of these blocks. And so I could made it, make it to my, as my major. And yeah, I must say uh, it was really fascinating for me uh, very intellectually stimulating work, uh, the challenge to work com uh, to learn computer programming. And I guess what was fascinating and what was different to the wet lab uh, in bioinformatics, if you have a problem, you sit down for one afternoon, do some coding, and you have solved your problem. You have that nice <laughs> feeling, uh, which is not always the case in the wet lab. Um, and yeah, uh, the field developed. We moved away from 3D structure of the proteins. Uh, systems biology started as the next big thing. And then, of course, precision medicine started. And um, with time, even more and more intellectual challenges came up. So I think I never managed to leave the field. It just stayed exciting, and this is what it is every day. Um, excited to, to what will be the next big thing. So <laughs> now, uh, if we talk about today, then it's the precision medicine. That's the field of your interest. So right. it's basically sequences, 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 right? Not only sequences. Now I'm moved away to multi-omics. So basically, my group is uh, we're jack of all trades at any disease, any omics type. We have to be really flexible. If it's proteomics or metabolomics, we have to, to jump on that, so. Okay, uh, how many years did you, uh, did you stay in, in, in Munich? About 13, so it was sought for just- So it's quite month. recent you came back to Latvia, uh, right? Yes, like a couple of years ago, I decided that it's time to, to go back perhaps and, uh, and apply uh, my knowledge. And the lab of bioinformatics at Stradinj University, how big is it? How many members do you have? Oh, it's dynamic, but uh, it's quite, quite small still. I think I would judge we're always four to five people, but of course, everyone interested, uh, you're welcome to join. So we're trying to, to expand, of course, but it takes time because indeed, um, one of the challenges is that uh, we need to start uh, oftentimes from scratch regarding, for example, computer programming, as mostly these are biologists choosing to do bioinformatics. And um, it, it takes a bit time and effort to learn that, but... Yeah, we're, my we're question was actually, those everyone who you are inviting now to join you, <laughs> what qualifications do they need to join your lab? Well, I think it's either or. So either you already can do computer programming and you have a very keen interest into biology and, and or medicine, or the opposite, you already have knowledge in biology uh, and medicine and you have a really keen interest into computer programming. I see, thank you. Thank you so much, Baiba, the first member who revealed this uh, not secret information about herself. Karina, you're the next, so please. Hi, so I hope I know. With sound effects, sound actually, sound actually, actually, yeah. Yeah. actually, yeah. I'm not sure. I hope I can, can, uh, can uh, express can, uh, myself can, uh, clearly. clearly. It's, a it's, a it's a bit difficult with, difficult with hearing this. Yeah, yeah with the yeah, yeah, echo. Yeah, echo. It, it, are there any possibilities to get rid of this echo? Yes, sure. Karina, a little, uh, some moments later, okay? Our, uh, our technical gurus will eliminate the echo. So, but then Martin, it's then your turn now. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So actually, uh, when I started uh, studying uh, in the academics, I studied chemistry, the word uh, bioinformatic even wasn't existent. 
So it was in the end of the 80s. Uh, so I studied chemistry by heart. I know it already since I was, I don't know, 10, 11 years old that I wanted to go into chemistry studies. And uh, then uh, later um, I switched uh, more into the uh, field of uh, neuroscience. So in the life science field. So I did my PhD in biophysics and biochemistry, uh, looking to ion channels, completely different topic. Um, and um, the classical career. And then I went over to the US for uh, postdoc time. So I started at California Institute of Technology, Caltech in uh, Pasadena and did a three-year term as a postdoc there. And uh, there I was uh, the first time uh, involved uh, with um, uh, genome sequencing. Actually, in our institute, we sequenced the uh, chromosome 22, the Q-arm of the Human Genome Project, of the first uh, Human Genome Project published then and later in 2001. And um, yeah, that was a time when, when really I was uh, getting uh, involved into, into human genetics and uh, get a better understanding, or we hope to get a better understanding actually, uh, of the human uh, genome. So we said um, once the human genome is sequenced, uh, we know everything. And uh, this was just before, two years, three years before the genome was published. But uh, then we realized that then the work really starts and we haven't understood anything. Uh, yeah, I remember those times. Yeah, yeah. That we shall cure all the diseases. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so I went actually to pharma company, um, to Bayer and then later to, to other pharma companies. Uh, because uh, Bayer at that time had a project um, crystallizing and, and analyzing 200 new identified proteins from the genome where uh, the pharma industry thought that these are important proteins for um, uh, as drug targets. So we analyzed, we did high throughput screening, we're looking for drugs, but I think beside the phosphodiesterase 11, really nothing came out. Uh, so this was a huge project. Uh, but still, I, I stayed in pharma development uh, for more than 15, 16 years and uh, did uh, mainly in the oncology field uh, drug development. Uh, first in the laboratory, then later as a uh, science manager and managing huge organizations. And uh, at a certain point, I get a little bit bored of it. And um, I met Holger Moch from the University Hospital in Zurich, uh, the pathologist there, the lead pathologist. And we were discussing um, how we can uh, do certain things uh, better in, in, uh, in the pathology. And at that time, um, uh, companies were starting with um, a comprehensive panel testing. Uh, that means precision medicine. So I... Uh, um, talked to him and said, look, I will set up your laboratory for precision medicine. Because you had the experience in, in genome exactly. sequencing in already. In genome sequencing and also in oncology. And uh, yeah, and that's uh, how I came to the university hospital. And actually, um, this was a, probably the best move ever, because uh, this is really the closest place you can be as a non-physician. Um, um, uh, to patients and uh, actually I deal more or less every day with patients which gave me a, give me a call and ask for the mutation and ask uh, why I have not identified this or that and uh, get some guidance and then we are discussing mainly together with the oncologist how to move forward and this is uh, really really a nice work. Maybe a short uh, side uh, from that. Um, uh, for example, just a really funny story. So we had, uh, uh, I, I received once a call from a, a physician and she said, I, I have here breast cancer, I want to get analyzed it. And I said, yeah, no problem. We do it 100 times per, per, per month. So just send me the sample. She said, not so easy. It's a dog. <laughs> it's a dog. And well, I said, okay. And uh, so then we were thinking about how to deal with the breast cancer of a dog. And what we did was um, a complete uh, whole uh, dog uh, sequencing, genome sequencing. So the dog had 36 chromosomes, uh, much more than we have uh, as, as humans. And uh, we analyzed and actually we found a BRCA mutation. We found exactly, and, and the, the dog, uh, you can probably uh, 
confirm that the dog, uh, the canine chromo chromosome set is almost identical to the human one, and so therefore it's much easier to, to look at the different um, hotspot mutations and to look if there is a mutation um, in the canine, in the dog, and we found one. How many chromosomes do the dogs have? You 36. 36. Yes, but, but the, the, the sequence of the, of the proteins is more or less exactly the same, so the match is more than 95%. So the analog genes? Yeah, the analog genes, of exactly. BRCA1 yes. and BRCA2, yeah, okay. Exactly, of all others as well. So not only BRCA, but we identified a BRCA mutation, and then the dog received Olaparib, uh, the PARP inhibitor, and uh, was treated. Uh, and the outcome? Well, in the end, and this is uh, always a sad thing, almost every dog receives uh, cancer at the end. So the cancer rate from dogs are much higher than from humans. We don't know yet why, but this is uh, something we, we are looking into, and three months, four months later, the dog died uh, in the end. Okay, yeah. But, but still, I mean, this is uh, really a funny side story, interesting story, and, and that you also can look into other animals to, to identify uh, the same mutations as we, as we see in humans. It just proves that this field of precision medicine, it, it uh, not only might, it al already has expanded exactly. into uh, veterinary and, exactly. and, and into, yeah. uh, let's say, treatment of other species, yeah. not only humans. Yeah, exactly. So, do you have any hobbies? Hobbies? Yeah, yes. like, I don't know, black yes. belt in karate or... No, don't, don't worry, don't paragliding worry. Paragliding It's safe or... to sit beside me. <laughs> 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 no, I'm uh, uh, actually, um, I'm a sailor, so I sail a lot. Uh, um, I was in the Navy for some years. And uh, so this attached me to just another one, uh, and, and hiking, so high altitude hiking, climbing. Is, uh, Switzerland doesn't have any, uh, any, any open waters to border with, well, like you oceans have or seas. Lake Constance, you have the uh, Geneva Lake, uh, so there's uh, some, some larger lakes where you can have a, uh, a sailing day at least. Uh, but, uh, but you have the mountains, and, and you can do a lot of hiking and altitude climbing. Okay, thank you so much. So. I see that Nils Rostox has joined us. Hello, Nils. If you, if you hear us, just give us a word so that we can be sure that... Okay, maybe later. Karina, let's try it now about the echo. May I do it? I think it it's works. good, no? It's good. Now it's good. It's your right, turn. Right, right, right. I also, I also finished, finished my, studies my studies at the University, University of Latvia. Latvia. I was the Faculty of Biology, and um, I did all my research thesis uh, in the uh, Latvian Biomedical Research and Studies Center. And after I finished my studies, I did a postdoc in the University of Zurich, which was quite an extensive postdoc of uh, around eight years, actually. And uh, now, recently, I was able to obtain the Swiss National Science Foundation career grant to start my lab at the Swiss uh, Federal uh, Institute of Technology. So that's how I came where I am now. And uh, in my lab, we're focusing on understanding how the immune cells are interacting with cancer cells. And there's one particular phenomenon, which has um, been recently only appreciated as something truly interesting. And this is called tertiary lymphoid structures, or meaning that lymphocytes or immune cells, when they enter tumor, they are not just simply scattered around the tumor somewhere. They're able to gather together in clusters and form something very similar to a lymph node. And lymph nodes in our body are the sites where immune cells actually can become activated and can become effector cells in order to solve problems that our body encounters, like pathogens or cancer for that matter. So that's the focus of, of my daily research. And uh, what keeps me excited is that, first of all, cancer is still a major challenge. Uh, nevertheless, we've been studying it for decades and decades. And immune system as well, it is as intricate and as complicated as I would say in the neural system. And we really barely are scratching the surface of these complex interactions and the regulation of these systems. And the both of them together, cancer and immunity is just a very exciting biological problem. And besides that, of course, it is also a um, major societal problem. And we've seen in the past decade or so that actually using the capacity of immune system to fight cancer can provide 
massive clinical benefit, as we see, for example, in melanoma patients, which actually, if you if you were diagnosed with the late stage melanoma some 15 years ago, this was basically a death sentence. Well, thanks to the discoveries in the field of immune oncology, it is no longer a death sentence. You actually half of these patients or even more already are absolutely cured by using immunotherapies. But of course, the fight is not over. We still need to understand why the other half of the patients do not respond properly. And besides melanoma, of course, there's multiple other uh, very frequent tumor types, such as lung cancer or colon cancer, that actually do not respond so well to these immunotherapies as we would have hoped. So there's lots of work to do to understand what are the underlying mechanisms, why the tumor is able to escape immune cell recognition and, or why the immune cells are unable to function if they are able to find the cancer cell. So you that are uh, focusing mainly on melanoma or do you make also research on other types of cancers? Yeah, we work on different types of cancers, including lung, colon, bladder, kidney, melanoma. Yeah, that's oh. that's our exactly. current uh, focus, but yeah, we, we always are looking forward as well to other collaborations with clinicians and um, looking at more tumor types. And you're the group leader. How big is the group? So I started really just this year. I uh, just finished interviewing the second PhD student, so the group is small. And then it will depend on the success, uh, on my success to get more grants, to acquire more money and be able to hire more people. Yeah, now it's now two PhD students and it's going to be master students that don't need to be paid, but that's <laughs> the group at the moment. Those PhD students, uh, what field, let's say, both are molecular biologists or... The field actually, so yeah, the they are both molecular biologists, but this is not something that would uh, be a, a restriction uh, to join a group like that. Uh, there's also students from pharmaceutical sciences, uh, from chemistry that uh, can, can join and uh, can do similar research. And uh, if I understood it correctly, it's mainly uh, working with cell cultures, uh, or do you have also um, facilities and equipment for uh, different DNA uh, manipulations like sequencing? Right. right, so cell culture is actually just a very, very small part of our daily work. Um, we mainly um, analyze patient material that comes from surgeries directly. So we, we look at tissues, we look at the three-dimensional information, the two-dimensional information and cellular interactions. Uh, especially because these immune cells, when they come together, they form these micro anatomical structures. So we are, we cannot really, um, we don't really have yet models that would uh, mimic this in cell culture efficiently because it's, it's interaction between immune cells, blood vessels, uh, stromal cells, um, and also the epithelial cells and, and cancer cells. So this is very, very tricky to model in cell culture conditions. So we're actually working with patient material. And then besides patient material, we also use experimental animals. Unfortunately, we cannot really avoid using experimental animals in immunology research um, because we have to be able somehow to look at the causation of a, a phenomenon to the outcome of survival, for example. When we analyze patient material, this is just one tiny snapshot in time. We obtain material after surgery, and what we find there, we can in no way uh, conclude that what we see there, for example, the immune cells present in the tumor, that they are uh, the ones responsible for the fact that the patient will or will not respond to treatment or will or will not survive longer or shorter. So we use experimental animals to uh, try to manipulate different immune parameters and observe directly the effect on tumor progression, survival of the animal, et cetera. So this, we are, we are really intrinsically, we need to use experimental models to yeah, answer our questions. So that's, that's uh, also a major part of our work. Okay. Um, your hobbies, what are you doing okay. Out, okay. outside the lab? Um, there's not much I can do outside the lab apart from seeing my two-year-old. <laughs> I used to sing a lot and I used to do some natural cosmetics, but now all of that is at the moment paused. <laughs> so I'm enjoying time with my son. Okay, congratulations, by the way. 
Thank you. Didn't congratulate you two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's so okay. I accept. When, <laughs> when, when can we when can we hope to see you in Latvia? Whenever you invite me. <laughs> For Christmas, I think. Most probably. Sure. Thank you, Karina. Thank you so much. So next on the list, Janis Lepinc, University of Latvia. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, I uh, have finished PhD in uh, University of Latvia, Faculty of Biology. Th this uh, we, yeah, we 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 made jokes about it yeah. actually. Yeah. All the uh, locals here in this discussion are. Uh, graduates from the Faculty of Biology, so it's like a graduate meeting. Sorry, yeah. Martin. Um, <laughs> Sorry, but, Terry. <laughs> uh, but uh, my field of specialization is microbiology. And I have worked and I still work in Institute of Microbiology and Biotechnology, University of Latvia. And um, I work with uh, an organism which is the most um, probably the organism we probably know the best in the world, the best eukaryotic organism we know the best in the world, it's baker's yeast or budding yeast. We know its uh, genome, we know its proteome, we know its metabolomics, whatever. And uh, it's you, you should be careful when you say we know everything about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and there are aspects we don't know, and that's what we are working on. So, um, uh, we work on uh, one feature of uh, this organism that uh, if you disrupt some uh, metabolic pathway, and I have to mention that ma main part of metabolic pathways in the yeast have uh, analogs in human or in animal cells. So, whatever you find out in yeast in terms of metabolomics, you can somehow apply this knowledge also to yeast, uh, to humans or to animal cells, which is great. So we work on purine synthesis pathway. Purines are necessary for DNA or RNA um, synthesis, and we concentrate on purine pathway, which produces adenine. And we have uh, mutants, which don't produce their own adenine, and we look how do these mutants behave if you don't give them adenine? So they are starving, starving for adenine. And uh, it's a rather bizarre situation. So organism needs to have adenine. You don't give uh, a specific uh, elements this adenine. And it, uh, it doesn't die. And that's a trick. That's amazing. It doesn't die, it becomes stress tolerant, it can survive for many days, maybe months, and so on, and so it's very bizarre. And we have several clues, why does it happen? And we just immerse ourselves into molecular mechanism. Why do this happen? And uh, how does re this relate to a real world out there? Uh, there are many uh, organisms which don't produce their own adenine. These are parasites. Malaria, toxoplasm, leishmania, uh, many parasitic worms don't produce their adenine. So in a way, by doing this to the yeast, you can uh, generate knowledge how do these organisms would behave if they lack uh, the necessary element of their lives. So um, that's one thing I do. And uh, I have my own small scientific group, which contains of uh, four uh, core persons, so me and three PhD students. And uh, the rest of our group is more or less like uh, fluidic, or how you could say, dynamic. <laughs> so sometimes it's rather big. No, the, like the, the perfect word was dynamic. dynamic I, I, yeah. I guess Karina used it. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's rather big, so up to Ten persons. Sometimes it's uh, six or seven persons, depending on uh, time of the year and the uh, status of uh, uh, our study year. And the amount of money available, right. right? Yeah, that's correct. And another thing we do is we organize National Olympiad of Biology, which is uh, a thing which might be look something apart from the main theme of today's discussion. However. Uh, we think that um, by 
writing uh, tasks for children, for, for high school children, uh, we actually have an opportunity to show them how rich and how sometimes difficult or uh, complex biology or medicine actually is. And tasks about precision medicine actually is, are one of the tasks we give to our students. But So you already have given uh, exercises or text uh, tasks at the Olympiads yeah. about yeah. Yeah. precision medicine, yeah. right? So, so the point is to um, challenge high school students. Uh, so uh, many of them really likes new challenges or new uh, some unknown situations to be solved. And uh, I know that many of uh, these high school students actually find themselves either in University of Stradinsh or in Faculty of Biology or in Cambridge University. So <laughs> many places. And uh, I think we have helped them to define their interests or to understand their uh, capabilities. That's a really good job you are doing. OK, and your hobbies? Um, picking mushrooms. <laughs> That's not a hobby. That every, every <laughs> Latvian does it, actually. <laughs> mm, well, autumn swimming. Autumn swimming. Yeah, right? it's autumn outside. It's swimming time. Uh, but not winter swimming. Uh, not yet. But let's uh, wait. Maybe this year would be also winter swimming. Okay. Thank you very much, Janis. Terry, last but not least, uh, it's your turn now to tell us uh, what do you do, why do you do that, and, and what, what, what's the big fun about it? Yeah, so to, um, to get to that in the end, I, I first want to go back to that day that Martin described, um, February 12th. 2001 that was the day that um sort of the spark was alighted in me um it was the publication of the human genome of the uh, the reference uh, genome and uh, i remember i vividly remember my professor coming in with the the two copies of science and nature with the two uh, respective um, genomes in it and I saw sort of the twinkle in his eyes, his enthusiasm about this sort of, well, landmark, basically, um, lighted the, the spark in me. Um, and I started to imagine about the, uh, the sort of the endless possibilities of um, uh, this information being available, the endless possibilities of variation in the human genome, um, obviously the endless possibilities of diseases that could be cured, and I think I was, I joined many of the others that in the, in the thought that, you know, now that we had the, the book, now that we had the genome, it would be very easy to solve all diseases and to, to cure everybody. Um, I think we were a little bit, uh, over enthusiastic, over optimistic, but that was to me, the starting point to think about, um, a career in genetics, uh, not so much because I was a big laboratory fan, um, maybe also not technically very skilled to be in the laboratory, but more to think about the, um, um, let's say the, well, the day-to-day -day opportunities that, um, that our genome uh, provides us or the, the, inform the richness of the information that our genome provides us. Um, and from there, I, well, I finished my, that was still my master's studies, um, I studied animal sciences, um, so I specialized in animal genetics. Uh, from there, I, uh, after a short break, I did a uh, PhD in human genetics, studying the um, the genetic background of schizophrenia. Um, and um, all that was to sort of gear up towards um, a, more of a policy position to try and shape uh, a policy with sort of genetics in the in in the back of my mind. So um, from there on, I started working on projects that uh, that more had um, an um, a question, a research question around the impact of genetics technologies and 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 uh, genetic variation in society as a whole. 
Um, and that eventually resulted in me now being the staff and faculty advisor, um, which uh, sounds very heavy and very boring and and also very policy like, but it basically means that I get to think of about uh, three to five years ahead. Uh, think of the sort of the um, the possibilities or the technologies that um, that may appear. Um, think of fun things that we can do with that and then propose that to our management team who will then say, well, most of the time, nine of the, out of 10 times, they say, ah, a nice idea, but maybe not. And then one out of 10, it, it really leads them to think about, okay, that may be a good direction to go to for our department. Uh, let's set up a pilot or an experiment or um, let's test something um, and then uh, see if we can implement it. And that can go from, I don't know, whole genome sequencing to um, uh, functional validation of variants to uh, the implementation of organoids as, as testing factories to, uh, I don't know, a new insurance model for uh, genetic care or a new implementation of a uh, of a new genetic care service. Um, and it basically means that I talk to a lot of people. I don't do much lab work anymore. Um, but I mostly go around the country interviewing stakeholders um, or potential stakeholders about their perspective uh, on a particular topic in uh, in genetics. Job, any interesting uh, hobbies or? Um, um, yeah, I'm a private chauffeur for my daughter who is um, uh, a fan of dancing and singing and has for the past year uh, uh, been singing in a, in a national choir and also did performances and, and television shows and everything. Um, so um, yeah, I basically was her private chauffeur um, and that may have um, sort of driven away the attention a little bit from my other two kids, uh, two boys. So I'm trying to catch up now. I see. Thank you, Therese. Thank you so much. So we all, we all, the present ones and also the ones online, have children here, right? Okay, and and even small ones. That's great. That's always great. Thank you. So thanks a lot, my dear partners. Uh, Nils is not uh, not uh, online anymore. Yeah, he warned us actually that he will be extremely busy today. So unfortunately. We don't have uh, him in our circle. Okay, if we now return to our subject, to precision medicine and uh, the teams that are required to uh, to succeed and to proceed in, in, in this field. I guess, Martin, uh, you're the perfect guy, actually, to ask. Uh, you said you met with the leading pathologist and then you had a nice conversation and you came to the idea that would be nice to join your efforts uh, and, and, and start, uh, st start helping people by, let's say, using the genetic data to uh, choose the, the, the perfect therapy for them. Okay, next steps. What's next? There is the idea now. There is a guy who knows uh, how to sequence. Uh, there's another guy who knows how to, um, um, how to understand all the uh, pathology samples and what do they mean and so on. Next steps. Actually, before was the economical sense, uh, before even starting sequencing, uh, when you set up such a thing, you really have to understand the economic part. Uh, you, you have to finance it. You have to find uh, a laboratory space. Uh, you have to uh, uh, deal with health insurances uh, to convince them that this is a, a good approach and that they are paying in the end in, in, in Switzerland uh, and reimbursing the patient's uh, uh, tests. All these things have to be done up front before you even start running the first sequence. 
So, and that actually was the reason why I came in and, and uh, from industry, because uh, in industry you're much, much more attached to the economical part, because in the end you have to be successful uh, in economic reasons, otherwise the company suffers. And uh, I'm relying a lot, uh, and I still do this today, and I'm relying a lot on the expertise, and now we are coming back to the uh, expertise uh, we are discussing here. Uh, on people uh, who have the right expertise, bioinformaticians, uh, people in the laboratory running the uh, sequencers, and uh, in the end, uh, people writing the clinical reports. And so, obviously, I cannot do it everything alone, and uh, we have a department of, uh, depends a little bit, uh, 12 to 15 FDEs. Um, FDE is a very technical term, it means full-time equivalent, and this simply means um, uh, the number of, of um, 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 not the number of headcounts. So we have around 18 to 20.